Hi there. Hey. hey. Thank you. We are talking today about uh, new FDA cybersecurity requirements for connected medical devices and how this is going to impact regulatory approval. Um, those uh, went into effect this year, shocker, uh, no surprise. So that is um, being done and that is affecting everybody who's trying to apply for medical devices now. So um, we'll get into uh, more of the definitions of some of these things, uh, but first I'd like to introduce the panelists. Uh, first we have uh, Dmitry. Dmitry, introduce yourself, please. Um, hi everyone, my name is Dmitry Vorostkov. I work in data art, we are technology consulting and custom software development company. My position is software security architect and I'm also leading our cybersecurity services. Just to add, our offerings include <coughs> security transformation projects where we establish and implement secure software development practices and help companies uh, to prepare for security certifications. Thank you, Dimitri. Sarah? Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Yushchek and I am Quality and Regulatory Affairs Manager at DataArt. My role is to support legal <coughs> manufacturers and the data art teams in any regulatory affairs related aspect of the project. Thank you, Sarah. I'm Paz Terry, uh, co-founder of CyberLogic Security. We are a cybersecurity uh, compliance and services focused company. We often work with uh, companies like DataArt in order to uh, get done some very large projects. And in this case, uh, we did. So we work with Data Art and uh, Vigilant Biosciences, who is our client. Dex, go ahead and introduce yourself and let's talk about you. All right. I'm Dex Manley and uh, Senior Director here at uh, Vigilant Biosciences. I manage our IT operations as well as our software development and uh, work together with uh, CyberLogic Security and Data Art to uh, help us deliver our security operations program uh, over the last about six months. It was a very successful program and uh, excited to be here and uh, you know, contribute whatever you, you need out of this conversation. Thanks, Dex. So to start with, we're going to get into lots of definitions about things. Um, so cyber device is the thing that we're really talking about. That's what the FDA is focused on. Um, it, so just a simple definition, it's a device that you uh, turn on and connect to a network, right? Internet, um, local network, something like that. So uh, we'll get into better definitions in a little bit, um, but that is the thing we're trying to talk about. Um, so Sarah, uh, this FDA regulation, uh, what is the scope of the change and what's the impact? Uh, the impact is very broad, and to help medical device manufacturers, FDA uh, publishes new guidelines, playbooks, and other regulatory uh, documents, such as uh, cybersecurity in medical devices, which is the primary guideline document uh, currently addressing cybersecurity aspects. Uh, if I may have the first slide, thank you very much. Uh, the timelines are um, already, the regulation is already in effect. And um, as the as Paz just said, um, cyber device can be any medical device despite its form uh, that is connected to the internet and may be exposed to cybersecurity threats. And about the applicability, just to say a few words, uh, can I uh, please have the next slide? Super. Um, the regulation applies to any company located anywhere in the world that would like to sell its products on the US market. And uh, which product uh, does it apply to? Uh, first of all, all of the new products that fulfill the conditions of connectivity, subject to any type of submission and products that are exempt from submission. Uh, but importantly, also existing products that will undergo a significant change. So if you have a product already in the market, you have to go and have that recertified. Is that right? Uh, if you are adding this functionality, then yes. Or if anything else changes in the risk profile of your device, then yes, FDA will require this additional documentation in the as part of the submission. Thank you. Uh, I would like to add that uh, cybersecurity not only means um, um, and add, uh, to add specific functions uh, to the product itself. Um, of course, this is very important, uh, but we must not forget about uh, implementing cybersecurity into the company's operations. 
and um, the post market continues monitoring. So where the majority of companies already have some kind of quality management system implemented, uh, such as ISO 13 or based on QSR or any other um, integration with the existing quality management system should be considered. Understood. So, and, and uh, to say that again, I think it's fairly important. Um, working with the current QA uh, and um, quality management system processes is the way to do this, right? There's a high level yes. of uh, compliance, governance, things that you have to do after the fact, correct? Okay. Thank you, sir. And to generate documentation at every step. Right. So why this new change? Uh, Dimitri, can you help us understand why the FDA enacted these regulations? Um, yes, yeah, sure, Pass. So I think FDA implemented these changes to address critical need for better security in these medical devices. As these devices become more connected, uh, be it internet, hospital, network, or just to each other, their vulnerability to cyber attack grows. Uh, this connectivity is great for patient care, of course, um, because it allows more efficient and coordinated treatment, but it opens up new risks. Um, and as you may realize, if someone hacks into your medical device, they could potentially mess with how device works, uh, which may cause direct harm, harm to the patient. I actually have the slideshow on which demonstrates classes of medical devices um, that had cybersecurity issues in the past. Uh, for example, in 2023, FDA issued an alert regarding Medtronic insulin pumps uh, found to be vulnerable to traffic interception and modification of insulin delivery commands. Uh, Medtronic issued urgent medical device correction with instructions how to reconfigure devices. Uh, one more case, for example, Beckton Dickinson had a disclosure of vulnerabilities in their infusion pumps, which could be attacked remotely. Uh, the attackers could modify drug formulas, dosages, and infusion rates. Um, so that's re really serious. Other classes of devices were found to be vulnerable, uh, which is pacemakers, uh, patient monitors, uh, hospital diagnostic equipment and some other classes. So I would say this move, move is about making sure that devices we rely on for health are not just effective, but also secure, protecting patients' health and well-being from dangers of cyber threats. Yeah, so you could say this is where technology kind of meets humanity uh, at the base level, right? We, we are talking about um, things that people depend on to live or have a better quality of life, uh, and these things can be attacked, which is despicable, but that's the world we live in, I think. Okay, so how does the FDA suggest companies address these new requirements? Uh, well, the FDA asks companies to make medical devices to include cybersecurity considerations in their design and development work. That should include identification of risks, uh, design requirements on addressing these risks, as well as evidence that security controls are effective and function as designed. FDA also recommends applying a secure product development framework, which includes all aspects of product development lifecycle, including design, development, testing, release, support, and so on. Companies may actually choose a framework that fits best. For example, it could be NIST SP800218, which is Secure Software Development Framework, or it could be NIST Cybersecurity Framework, or it could be ISO 20,000 Family Standards, or it could be other medical device-specific frameworks that companies currently adopt. So it seems as though, I mean, this is uh, true, is that uh, development for software in this company, in this country rather, uh, has certainly not kept security in mind uh, for, for as long as I can remember, right? So it's saying, hey, security needs to be in mind from the beginning, I think. It needs to be baked into the DNA of your company and your processes as you build software devices, whatever you're building. Is that the case? I think so, yes. Uh, so, can you help us understand the difference between, so you mentioned a lot of uh, different frameworks and, uh, and standards there. So uh, NIST 800-218 uh, seems like a great fit for this, but there's also ISO 27001, uh, 27001, uh, which deals with some of the same things. Tell us the difference between those two and compare those, please. Uh, yeah, there are different options indeed, and these frameworks actually target different uh, aims. For example, ISO 20001 provides a comprehensive set of guidelines and best practices for organization-wide approach to managing information security risks. It's very broad in scope, covering all aspects of information security management, and it's not limited only to software development. 
And the other one, the NIST SP800218, for example, it's specifically focused on software development. It provides a set of secure software development practices that organization can apply to minimize the number of vulnerabilities in their software and also address the root causes of vulnerabilities. So I think it may better speak companies who develop a product. Understood. Okay, so it's a focused and newer framework purpose-built to help secure software. Okay, uh, the NIST one. Gotcha. Uh, so what activities uh, do we have to do as a company trying to gain this uh, FDA uh, acceptance? Uh, what are the activities we have to do? Can you give us more of an idea of those? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so updated guidance is a quite detailed 50-page document that outlines key principles that companies should consider, as well as recommendations on specific cybersecurity information to be included into submissions. Uh, the list of activities is not very sophisticated, actually, and they generally fit industry-adopted security frameworks. Uh, for instance, companies must develop a security risk management plan uh, that outlines how to identify, evaluate, and monitor cybersecurity risks associated with their medical devices. Uh, as part of this plan, companies should conduct periodic threat modeling as well as risk assessment to determine necessary measures to mitigate these risks. Companies must also provide sufficient evidence uh, of these processes as part of their pre-market submission. Um, another example I can say, like for example, up-to-date inventory of all third-party software components, which is known as Software Bill of Materials or SBOM. Companies are expected to evaluate security of these third-party dependencies, components, monitor them for new vulnerabilities, and take appropriate measures to manage associated risks. Uh, for example, they must ensure that they can update or patch any third-party software as needed during the release time. During submission, device manufacturers must provide as BOM and additional information, such as third-party software support levels and the end of support dates. What is even more important, I can say that companies must adopt a holistic approach to designing security controls for their medical devices, taking into account the set of risks uh, applicable that uh, for device functionality. FDA suggests uh, that submissions include solid documentation covering security design, several architecture views that highlight sensitive information flows and the use of security controls, as well as requirements and acceptance criteria for each of these security controls. As you can see on the slide, it's quite a lot of items and more activities and documentation required, but in the sake of um, interest of time, I'm not going to go through the details. <laughs> of course. Well, that is a long list. Yeah. So we hear a lot about S-bombs these days. Thanks for that definition. Uh, and, and that is important because we have these sometimes hidden things in there and we have third party uh, solutions that we reuse. Uh, and if we're not updating those as well, we create more vulnerabilities. Okay, so now we've set the stage for uh, what seems like uh, a very large hurdle to, to jump here uh, for any company that's seeking this regulate, regulatory approval. Um, so we've set this stage for a difficult thing. We know it's necessary because uh, humans need to be protected, obviously, from ourselves and from technology. So Dex, uh, enter uh, Vigilant Biosciences. You guys have a product. Let's hear about your story and how this came to be. Sure. Yeah, we uh, our, our product is a, a lateral flow device reader that uh, we've been in development with for a while. And uh, what it does is it will, if you know what a pregnancy test is or a COVID test or a strep test, it's a cassette. We read that and then we look at certain biomarkers that correlate to potentials for oral cancer. So it's an early warning system for people that might may, may be at risk for oral cancer. So that's what we're developing. It's a it's a it's a device that you know it's a self-contained device. It it's uh, something that is meant to be in dental offices or potentially, you know, it could potentially go to other types of users. But that's the the primary user. And some of these dentists are in a larger practice connected to a, a larger ecosystem of other practices, etc. So there can be a lot of different devices and network connectivity, etc. And this device is network uh, connected to the cloud uh, for certain kinds of capabilities. And, um, you know, when we started development, we were looking at the ISO that you showed, uh, 27001, and it gives a lot of broad guidance, as Dimitri said, for your organization, et cetera. Um, but it was challenging to look at all of that and figure out, well, what do we actually need to deliver to be in compliance? And then, you know, with the executive order that came out a couple of years ago about cybersecurity being a must have requirement for medical device manufacturers, uh, you know, we're a relatively small company. 
Um, we've got a great uh, QA and regulatory team, but but we're small. And uh, and same thing with our our software development as well. So so we we needed some help with this. And uh, the first need that we had was for penetration testing because we knew that we we couldn't put the device out on the market without really having it pen tested. And that's how uh, we got involved with UPAS, as you know. And so uh, and then of course with Data Art as well, uh, doing the penetration testing for us. We got great results back and a list of things that we needed to change. But, you know, obviously it didn't just stop there. We had to implement the, an entire security operations program to be in compliance. And it's funny, too, because we wouldn't have known how to navigate. You know, first of all, do we pick NIST? What framework do we pick? And, and, and you guys, with your expertise, you all really helped us with that uh, because we, we were really focused on, on ISO. Um, and the reality is the, the ISO standard, I, I don't feel like if you just follow that based on, you know, what I've learned working with all of you is that that really is not maybe comprehensive enough. So we went with the NIST uh, framework and uh, we learned uh, quite a number of things. For example, one, one small thing, Dimitri mentioned the SBOM and the software bill of materials. Uh, in the ISO, that same concept is referred to as SOOP, software of unknown origin. It's anything that you use that you don't develop yourself. Right, that is provided by another company, and and so we've developed our device on the Raspberry Pi operating system, and uh, everything else is kind of custom built, including our hardware. And uh, the reality is understanding all of the components that we use to develop the software application that runs on the device. It's a very long list of components, and and so it's really. The, the S bomb is a lot more comprehensive because it gets into all the details of when the software was in the, you know, whatever you're using, whatever component you may be using, when was it released? Uh, when is the end of life? What are the current vulnerabilities that are already known about that component? And do you need to fix them or not? So it, it gives you another deeper level of understanding about what's in your system, what needs to be fixed, et cetera, et cetera. And the one of the bigger things that we learned is, is you know, you, you can't just do penetration testing, fix those gaps and say, hey, we're good to go, right? right. We had to develop with your, your guidance a security operations program, which not only handles the challenges and addresses the vulnerabilities that you currently have in the product that you need to fix, but also creating a program that's ongoing. Like we have to do activities quarterly, uh, semi-annually and annually. And it's an entire program that that basically kind of runs forever as long as you have a connected device on the market. So I probably right. said said more than my piece now, but if you have any other questions, obviously. No, that's great. Um, and so it, I'm not a doctor, obviously, you know me, Dex, but um, <laughs> this team is the early prevention is the key to catching a lot of these things. So your product sounds like a, a worthy uh, endeavor. So um, let's talk just for a little bit about Teams. Um, and let me say one thing that I forgot to say in the beginning. Sorry about that. Uh, send in your questions. If you have questions, please put them in the comments. We're watching those and we'll try to answer those at the very end. Um, so the Teams, this was an interesting uh, prospect. So I'll just talk for a second about that. And we had uh, literally Teams, um, you know, we had meetings with people in six, seven different countries at different times in different time zones, right? That was interesting. So what worked well about that is obviously uh, data art is filled with uh, very bright uh, and very good people at what they do. So everybody's a professional. Everybody's coming with their best work. Um, no egos really in the room. And we hit our timelines, right? And there's no secret to that. Um, be nice and be on time was most of the of the project, honestly, to keep that going. So um, that worked uh, very well. Um, we also had kind of a, a mid-shift change there. Dex, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, initially, we just came in with FDA because we were in the middle of an FDA submission. We still have some things that we're dealing with there uh, that are unrelated to the cybersecurity piece, actually. Uh, but we... Um, you know, we started with the idea that we're going to submit to the FDA and that was what our focus was. But, you know, we we don't want to just uh, distribute our products in the United States. Uh, we we want to go worldwide with our products and Europe is a big market. So they have a new regulation as well called IVDR. We're currently on the market there with our product under IVDD, which is the old standard. Uh, but with the new standard, it's also a lot more comprehensive of 
uh, having to have cybersecurity uh, addressed. And so we 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 were kind of only about two months left in the project, and and we came to you and said, look, can we also address everything that needs to be addressed for the IVDR regulation? And so Sarah. Uh, was was really great at helping us to navigate the documentation because, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of the FDA regulations and IVDR regulations overlap. So we were covered on, let's just say, eighty percent of that with what we had already been doing. But that the the sort of delta, the divergence in the two uh, regulations, we we had to cover those gaps. And so you guys did an amazing job of of helping to navigate that and run a parallel path between what we needed to get done for FDA and what needed to be done for the IVDR as well. And uh, and again, without any real notice, except for just a few months left in the project. So, because we did submit to IVDR as well at the end of that, so I should say. So. Yeah, it's tough to be agile with such a large distributed team, um, but you know we can make that work. And with data arts uh, resources, we we were able to make that happen. And congratulations, that was uh, again a great effort, and uh, we hope for your continued success in that. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, just kind of wrapping things up here uh, before we get to questions from from the viewers. Um, anybody have final notes or tips you want to share with folks? Sarah? I mean, uh, I don't want to dominate the conversation, yeah. but, you know, I, I would say for anybody out there that's trying to do this, uh, the reality is the sooner you get started, the better. Uh, number one for IVDR, I, I think the, the wait time is like a year about, about or thereabouts right now. At least it was when we started to engage with that process. So I would highly recommend that if you have any desire to to ship your devices to Europe that you get started right away with getting that process going. Uh, so that that's kind of one thing that we learned as an organization. Um, and I would just say in terms of working with a distributed team, you know, a lot of folks that are watching this may already have that experience. Um, and, and, you know, I, I can just underscore that in doing that, you really have to be engaged as the primary stakeholder or stakeholders, you, you've got to make sure you're driving those conversations with your team. So like with CyberLogic and Data Art, you know, we had a really good cadence of weekly meetings and, and uh, that was just a, a baseline, but we had probably three, four, five meetings a week with various different people on the team. I mean, and I think that's one thing that also should be said is it wasn't just the four of us on this call. My team, I have a QA, and regulatory person, a manufacturing person, an operations person. I've got a, a QA, software QA person on my team. And then I also have our outsourced partner that helps us, Tidepool. They're not here today, but they are an amazing team. And that's my development team. And I've got three developers, a QA person, a UI UX person over there, and their CTO who works closely with me as well on our product, dedicated to our product. So that's you know 10 or more people, 10 to 15 people that are working on our side of the fence. And then you all also had pause you and, and Michael, your partner have provided a lot of very excellent guidance to us, at least initially. And, well, not initially all throughout the whole product, but I'm just, uh, or time that we work together, but initially getting us going was very helpful. And then joining together with Data Arts, we had two DevOps engineers, Right. We had uh, Dimitri in the background also working with another security framework architect uh, and and a, a couple of other QA people. So the team, the overall team was 20, 25 people working on this. And there's absolutely no way we could have done that internally. There's just no way. And I, I work with a lot of smart people on my team. But having you help us through that process to guide, I'm just saying get started as early as possible and make sure your communication is very high because there were times where, you know, we would think something and, and you had another thought and we just would get on a call and say, hey, here's the challenge we're facing. What do we have to do to solve this? And you guys did a great job of going back and really bending over backwards to meet our needs or help us where we needed help with. And it was, you know, we weren't just writing the documentation. Sarah, you know, you wrote a lot of the documentation for us, but it was a collaborative process. So even if you're hiring data art, and CyberLogic Security to do things, they will pause delivered a number of documents for us on our behalf. 
That said, that's just the starting point because we had to review and read every single word of every single document that was produced. And we had to make sure that we understood it and made it fit with our organization because even though they delivered the documents, we had to make sure that they worked for our scenario because they can't understand, you know, data art and cyber logic security doesn't know everything about our company, how we operate. So it, again, you can't just, it, it, it's truly a collaborative process with your organization and with what you, what you folks did for us, because uh, it, it, we, it's not a thing where we could just hire you and say, okay, you know, do all this because it's not just documentation. We had to implement a lot of things on the software side of the house too, like the S bomb. That's a documentation piece, but we had to implement certain things that would help us generate the S bomb on the software side. A lot of the frameworks that we had to implement, like I'll just give one example. There's a tool called bearer. It's a, a software tool that runs every time we do a software build and it picks up vulnerabilities. Now we're in the middle of a new release. Uh, we had solved all of our cybersecurity issues that were found in penetration testing. All of those issues got handled and developed on the development side. But in this new release that we're trying to get out in October, we found six, uh, this bearer tool. It's an automated testing tool. found 65 additional cyber software security issues between our last release, which was maybe a month and a half ago. And now 65 new issues that it found automatically. But that was a tool we had to implement as part of our process. And by the way, we fixed those those 65 issues, which you guys never heard me say before. So so anyway, uh, that's just kind of, you know, uh, the, the basics of, of what I wanted to say to, to, you know, start early, get your team together, make sure you maintain high communication levels and just work with your team. Uh, and and you guys did an amazing job. So thank you so much. Thanks, Dex. Yeah, you had a great team. We we uh, we really enjoyed that. I think all of us. I know I did. And Michael did, too. Uh, Sarah, any quick tips? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Dex. It's uh, such a pleasure to hear this feedback. Um, well, from my side, my quick tip would be to engage um, a regulatory support as early as possible. That will allow you to deal with uh, any potential challenges and risks early on to choose the best and most um, efficient strategy, to choose your markets, to plan for um, which um, requirements will be common for these different markets. So it will not uh, delay working um, during the project. I believe that um, it's the best advice I could get. Uh, you probably can hear it during every webinar uh, that is even touching upon regulatory aspects, but it is, really working and uh, it's adding a lot of value. Yeah, again, thanks for your guidance, Sarah, with the uh, IBDR markets uh, uh, specifically. Uh, such a wealth of knowledge in that head. You're amazing, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri, any quick tips you want to share? Um, yeah, uh, quite similar tip. Obviously, if you read FDA guidance, they also want to say that security should be like a component on top of your solution. Instead, it should be embedded into your solution from the very beginning. You need to think early on about security measures. Maybe you can even do team education so they understand security concept, all your team, including developers, support operations, and so on. And then you kind of embed the security design in the product. Uh, that requires a kind of skill. It's not something they can you can easily Google and find out. So maybe think about it early on indeed and uh, make sure that uh, your development process uh, embeds the security step into every stage. Um, that's my advice. Okay. Yeah, and I would say the same thing. I don't really have much to add. Um, work with professionals, and it uh, it helps quite a bit. Um, so we can get it now into some questions from the from the group from the viewers. Uh, Dimitri, I'll stick with you for a second. This question is about the S bomb, uh, software bill of materials. Uh, what do you do if your product uses legacy components that are not supported anymore? Uh, well, unfortunately, it's not a good news. You really need to think about uh, using components that are supported and maintained just because you need to patch them up if the issue appears within these components. You may still uh, use that components if you find other mitigation strategies, how to 
uh, resolve the problems in case if they appear or maybe there are some known issues and you can analyze them. You really need to do some due diligence on this component, what type of risk it opens up for you. Maybe it sits um, deep in the back end and doesn't allow exploitation, or it may be front side component that could be uh, that could be vulnerable to external attacks. So no easy answer, you need to analyze it, but um, general answer that you may need to find the alternative components that are supported currently and then uh, migrate to them. Okay, and it should be in this case, this day and age that most components you're using, there should be a modern, something newer that you could use, right? Just because you're used to using the old component doesn't mean that there isn't something modern out there or newer. I think we'd be hard pressed to find something that didn't have a solution out there. Yeah, yeah, and and if you don't mind, if I just tag on to what yeah. Dimitri was saying, you know, one of the things too, for example, with with the Raspberry Pi, you know, the 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 version that we started with, version eleven, is end of was end of life in June of this year, and that's that's the operating system. So now, how do you move from eleven to twelve? And and I will say, uh, especially if you have a device in the field. So one of the things about our device is it's uh, uh, we have an auto update, right? That the user can turn on the device and we can push an update to the device, just like you would get with Windows or iOS or whatever. You'll get a notification, hey, there's there's something new out there, right? But how do you uh, how do you push an entire OS over an auto update? Those are things that you have to think about, right? Like we had to re-architect uh, some of the ways we think about how we push our updates. If you want to push a whole new operating system, that requires a different kind of architecture and things like that. So it's all these little details that you're going to learn along the way, but you, you, as best as you can to plan for future obsolescence or, you know, how, how are you going to update your units? Whether are you going to do it over the cloud through the cloud, like we're doing, or are you going to do it, send customers a USB stick and have them do it or a technician go to all of your customers and do it. You know, those are things that you got to think about in that regard as well. So, um, that's really good information. Thanks, Dex. Thanks. Yep. Uh, a couple more questions coming up. Let's see. Sarah, let's talk to you for a second. Is it possible to integrate ISO 13485 with NIST? Uh, yes. A short answer. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I confirm. Uh, we did that successfully with Dex and Fujilan Biosciences. Although it may not be as elegant as with uh, integrating between different ISO standards, but um, it is possible, and uh, we did that on the within the expected timelines. Yeah, and so for a lot of you, there are control mappings too. If you're going between standards, they say this control means this, and this side, and that means that. Uh, on the American side, we see that quite a bit. Um, and in case, uh, in point of fact, we were able to have a lot of the IVDR stuff done. In a Venn diagram, the IVDR, I think Dex said 80% was about the same. I think that's probably about probably about right. Um, so we were able to do that, uh, and there's a lot of similarities between the two. Okay, thanks, Sarah. That helps a lot. Uh, Dimitri, what kind of security testing is required for new submissions? Uh, well, in fact, FDA includes quite a lot of security testing requirements, more than typical standard would. So they ask you to test for security requirements. So basically, you write security requirements, and then you write acceptance criteria, and then you test them. It's more like you know functional testing for security features. Uh, also, you need to run the fast testing when the uh, for every possible input of device, uh, you need to put various data which could potentially break the system and cause security problems. You need to do static code analysis, you need to do dynamic code analysis, you need to do software composition analysis, which is uh, dependency testing, and you, of course, need to do pen testing. Again, this is on the recommendations, what they expect to see in submissions, but it's not a mandatory requirement. So um, it, it may scale up to your device and how connected it is. Yeah, and, and and actually, you know, that 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 makes me think of the fact that we we had to change certain things on our development stack and the way that our developers had to work together, like code reviews. Sure, everybody does code reviews or should be doing code reviews, but it's a little bit more formal process for that. And there are a number of other things that you know I won't get into, uh, but that's you know that that those are things that you'll learn about that you have to really regiment your software development processes, as well as consider your software planning uh, and, and have it be cybersecurity specific, so. 
And, and I think it needs to be said that's kind of a mix what, what Dimitri's talking about. There's a mix of automated things that can do some of those, uh, some of that testing. Uh, a lot of it's still manual, right? A lot of it still has to be done by humans. So um, we, we're not there yet. AI may help us out at some point to get some of this stuff done, but right now it's it's a fairly manual process. Okay. Uh, any last minute thoughts or questions, folks? No, I would just say if you, I, 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 I meant to talk about this earlier, but I forgot. But one of the first conversations we had with you, because our, our device is kind of a, a low risk device, if you will, right? Sits in the dentist office. We, we put the test in. It's not, you know, like some of the things that Dimitri mentioned in that earlier slide where he showed like an insulin pump, right? Connected to the, to the internet. That's pretty serious because that's directly connected to an individual that better be secure because you don't want a hacker going in there and changing the level of insulin somebody ingests right with our device it's not that risky but um the 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 when we went to you initially uh pause we're like do we really need to do all can we just say because we don't collect any personally identifying information right we just collect clinical factors but we it's not related to a person we don't we don't have any of their information in our system so you know and okay maybe a hacker gets in and, and you know attacks our device and maybe they steal some of our intellectual property right like okay so that's a risk on our side as a company but it doesn't put you know the 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 customers at risk the patients at risk so you know do we do we really need to do this and the, the best thing that you that sealed the deal for me is you said well look if your device is sitting in uh, like a dental office connected to a hospital or other, you know, other dentists, whatever, and a, a hacker gets in there and they attack your device, that device could be used as a zombie device. I don't even know if that's the right term to attack other devices on that network. And that there have been a, a lot of cases of where that's happened. Somebody had this device like ours. They thought it was innocuous. And nobody cares about who, who's going to care about that device. But it's a way for them to get into the broader network. And so when you really think of things that way, it, it really becomes apparent that even if you've got a device like ours, which is low risk, and you're saying, well, do we really need to do it? Yeah, you really need to do it. So, you know, um, yeah. It, 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 you know, it's just something you have to do if you're going to be connected to the internet. And this is that, yeah, this is the problem we have with the internet of things, all these small devices that are now plugged into stuff, right? We don't really think that's got a web server on it. That's, that's, that can potentially attack my network if I leave it sitting there. Um, common thing that happens. So I appreciate that, Dex. That's good feedback. If we have no further questions, I think we are uh, about done for today. Uh, we very much appreciate everybody hanging in there and sticking with this uh, somewhat dry topic. Um, and, and again, thanks for our, our panelists today. Dex, great to see you again and always great to talk to you. Thank you. You too. Dimitri and Sarah, thanks for your expertise and for joining today.